Hey guys, before we get started today, I wanted to let you know that I have decided to give Patreon a third and final shot as a tip jar sort of a thing. I've tried it a couple of times before and couldn't figure out a format that would work for me, but I think that using it as a tip jar to be able to buy more video equipment and stuff will be something that will work out better for me long term. So I have restarted that and I'm going to put a link below. And now on to the voiceover. So today's video is about making a mixing chart for your watercolors. The first thing I'm going to do is make an eight inch by eight inch rectangle, or not a rectangle, it's a square. I know my shapes, okay? Okay, so we got a square here and then I'm gonna make one inch marks all the way down and then I'm gonna turn it and I'm gonna make one inch marks across. That way we have squares. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to label across one side in the order the colors appear in the box. And then when I do that, I'm going to turn it and down the other side I'm going to label in the same order. So at the top, the first box is going to have Davies Gray on both sides of it. And all that box is going to be is Davies Gray. It will not be any other colors mixed into it, just Davies Gray. Then the next box to the right will be a mixture of Davies Gray and Russelt Brown. I think it's supposed to be Russet, but it's spelled Russelt on the tube, so don't don't bother me about it, okay? I don't want to hear about it. So generally the way that I am going to mix these colors is I'm going to start on the left and I'm going to paint across that top row Davies Gray in all the boxes from left to right. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to add the color on the top to the box below. So the first box says Davies at the top, so I'm going to mix Davies Gray and Davies together. On the next box it says Russelt on the top and Davies on the left, so I'm going to mix Russelt Brown and Davies Gray in the second box. And then in the third box it says Olive Green on the top and Davies Gray on the left, so the third box is going to be Davies Gray and Olive Green mixed together. Sometimes I won't do it exactly like that because I'm only a person and I'm not perfect. So you should do what I say, not what I do, because sometimes I forget what I'm doing. Since I'm mixing mostly just neutral colors together at this point in the palette, it kind of looks like baby poop, okay? But it will get more interesting later on as you add in pretty colors like blue. Until then, yeah, it kind of looks like, you know, these are the colors your stool could be you're a healthy person, maybe. Some of those, maybe not so much. Why am I talking about poop? I don't know. You know, hashtag mom life. <laughs> so now I'm getting into orange and red, and this is where things get a little bit weird sometimes because some of these colors are so, so, so hyper pigmented that when you're trying to mix them with other colors, they just obliterate everything else. So sometimes I I have to dab away a little bit of the color and sometimes I end up adding in a lot more of the other colors to try and make a mixture. Otherwise you almost can't tell that I've added anything. You may find that this is also true for you and that you struggle a little bit with some of these colors, especially like that blue that I just put down. That is such a hyper pigmented blue. The other thing that you're going to want to do that I'm clearly not doing a good job of is try to keep the amount of pigment in each square sort of even so that you have a reliable result here. If you're not keeping it even all the way across the squares, it may look like it blends or mixes easier with a certain pigment or one pigment is stronger than the other when it's not really. So try to keep your pigment even which I didn't do because I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of lazy sometimes, you guys. I, I don't know. Plus, I wasn't really planning to use this one. This was just a demo. If I was going to actually use this one, I probably would do a better job, probably. No guarantees, but probably. But I really just wanted to show you what a smaller one of these would look like because most people don't have a ginormous palette and... At this point, I still wasn't exactly sure how I was going to make a chart for my 14 color palette because I really didn't want to have to make a palette or a color chart that was like 15 inches or 16 inches by 16 inches. 
since this is for a portable uh, field kit type palette that I made for myself. Ultimately what my plan is, or my goal, is to have a color chart that isn't a whole lot bigger than my field kit, otherwise what is the point? I have to haul around this giant color chart or just not take it? That doesn't really make any sense. But we'll get to what I did. So if you have eight colors or a smaller color chart, this will be fine for you. There are a lot of other options out there for making color charts. In the past, I have mentioned these little color booklets that I make, and basically the color stripe at the top is the color that all the other colors are being mixed with in that particular little booklet. These take a really long time to make. I can spend a couple of evenings on each one of these. But you can tell when I do it this way that even a slightly different blue yields a drastically different result when it is mixed with the same exact colors. So this is why I have 125 colors. I'm not just an insane person and I have more like two or 300 colors. But this is why, because a slightly different pigment will change the color mixtures that you get tremendously. However, again, this takes a really long time and each booklet is only for one color. If I wanted to make one of these for my 14 color palette, I would have to make 14 of these booklets. That's a little bit too much for something like this. Another option would be to make color wheels, but again, you'd have to make like 14 of them. I think that these color wheels and color booklets that I prefer are better as sort of a master color chart item that you keep in your studio. Because if I was gonna haul around color charts and booklets and wheels for these palettes right here, these are my daily, everyday palettes that I use. I mean, that would be like, I don't even know, 10 pounds of booklets or something. I mean, that's crazy. So this is why we're talking about a portable palette color mixing chart instead of the crazy watercolor booklets that I have and have made and I'm still making because I've been working on them for like a year and I still don't have enough of them for like every color. So here we are. We have this thing that I made and it will not work because it doesn't have all the colors. And if I wanted to make one with all the colors in my little 14 color palette, it would be way too big. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a seven by seven inch square, and then I'm going to make half inch marks. This is going to yield boxes that are tiny. And if they were any smaller, they would not be of any use. So I wouldn't do smaller than half inch boxes unless you have better vision than me. Maybe you could make it work, but I could not. So it's the same process. Now what I'm doing here is I'm going diagonally down because these are just the colors mixed with themselves. So I'm just gonna get this out of the way. As you can see, this is where the colors are the pure pigment with nothing else. And when I get done with this, I'm actually going to draw with a uh, fine point pen, a line that marks out where those pure pigments are. So I, I know what I'm looking at. I have like a reference point on the chart if I wanna just glance at it. Now I will tell you, I am a little bit dyslexic and this became very confusing. This size of color chart is a little bit challenging for me. For someone else it might not be an issue, but for me there were times where I got confused and started to make mistakes. This process ended up taking me a while, it was like a few hours. Um, I worked on it one evening and part of the next day. It is something that you should have though. I mean it's really important to know what kind of colors you can mix. So making something like this does take time, but it's a worthwhile investment in yourself and in your paint. You've already bought the paint, you might as well spend a little bit of time to get the most out of your monetary or financial investment. This also lets you know whether or not you need to buy more paint. And I know that sounds crazy, but to some of you. Some of you are paint hoarders like yours truly, so more paint, I mean, that always sounds great. For some of you, you're like, hey, you already have too much, but no, I don't have too much. The thing is you have to look at the tubes and forget the stuff on the front that says that it's cadmium red or whatever. You have to look at the back where it has these fine texts and a little tiny number that might say something like, uh, 
let me grab a tube of paint just for an example here. I have a Schmincke Sienna, uh, okay, it's raw Sienna. On the back, it says stuff in German. Where is the number? Okay, so on the back, it says that it is PBR7 and PY43. Those are the two pigments that they mix together to make this Schmincke raw Sienna. I also have a tube of raw sienna by Winsor & Newton and this one says that it is made from transparent synthetic iron oxides PY42 and PR101. Now it looks very similar and it says it is the same color but it's not the same pigment. I have another one from Grumbacher. This one says that it is PY42. Now that's the same one that is in the Winsor & Newton raw sienna, but the Winsor & Newton is also mixed with PR101, so they look a little different. Some other colors that I have that are similar are Verona Gold Ochre by Daniel Smith, which is PY43. Another one is raw sienna light, also by Daniel Smith. This one says it's PY42, but it looks different than all the other ones that say that they have PY42. Why does this happen? It turns out that there are basically about four major suppliers of pigments in the world and they supply the pigments for most of the companies that make paint however they don't all source their pigments from the same place and so where you get a pigment can determine what it actually looks like and I have some colors that say that they are PY42 or something and they don't even look like a sienna at all this is why you need to look at what's on the tube and why it's not crazy to own a whole bunch of different watercolors or even oil paints or acrylic paints. The actual pigment that they use to make the color can be very different from one brand to the next. And you may have two pigments that have the same number, but from different brands, they're sourced from different places and they may look totally different. At this point, I started skipping a line so that there would be dry paper to separate my colors. I didn't want them to bleed into each other and ruin all of my mixtures. Now this also caused me to start making mistakes because again, dyslexia. So in a short time here, you're gonna see me make a big mistake, but don't worry because I'm gonna show you how to fix it if you also make the same mistake. There's a lot of people that think that if you make a mistake in watercolor, it's totally uncorrectable. There's nothing you can do. You've ruined your paper and you need to start over. And honestly, I don't know where people come up with this stuff. If you know how to use watercolors, then you won't have any issue correcting your mistakes. There's a lot of different tricks you can use. And you know, sometimes you do have to start over, but that's pretty rare that you really ruin something and can't repair it at all. Different methods of corrections that you can use are simply trying to lift the pigment. Now this sometimes will not work because sometimes the pigment is a staining pigment. Now we're gonna speed this video up a little bit and get to the point where I make my mistake. As you can see, I have decided to go back to where I had some dry paper and I am painting in, I think it's umber, yeah, it's some umber color. I don't remember if it's raw or burnt. And now after I do that, I'm gonna move on to leaf. Now I start out mixing colors into leaf and then for some reason I get distracted or I forget where I'm at or I just fall victim to dyslexia again and I start accidentally mixing Davies and Payne's Gray into my Oriolan which I had already mixed. So I realize I've made a mistake and then I try to lift it out, but it won't make the paper white enough again for the Oriolan to show up. This is because Oriolan is a light yellow color and it just really won't cover over that Payne's gray or the Davies gray. So at this point I start using a ruler to keep myself from going into the wrong line and now I'm going to let that paper dry because I'm going to repair the paper. In my attempt to lift the color off, I have started to degrade the surface of the paper and I can see the fibers of the paper lifting away. Usually I use a cheap paper when I make color charts because I don't wanna spend a ton of money 
on paper for color charts. It's a little bit silly to do that. But the problem with cheaper paper is that it does tend to fall apart a little bit easier than more expensive paper. So now that I've been an idiot and screwed up and made a mistake and ruined my paper, I have to fix it. And to do this, I'm going to use Daniel Smith's watercolor ground. It kind of looks like gesso, but it's way thicker than gesso. I don't like to just dip my brush into the pot and try to brush it on because it won't make a very thick layer. So I'm going to get out this porcelain dish that I need to clean and I'm too lazy to do so. And I'm going to take a palette knife and get out a gob of this stuff, which you can see is kind of stiff, almost like frosting. And I'm going to just put some of it in there and I'm going to try to pick up like a scoop of it and then spread it on the paper like it's frosting. You don't want it to be super duper thick and it will leave a texture if you leave brush marks in it. So try to make it smooth for this. But if you wanted to use this to add like a textural effect to your watercolor paintings, you can totally use it for that. It's kind of cool. So I'm going to very carefully fill in the square without covering up the lines so that I have white paper to work on again. This stuff is a little bit different than paper. It lifts a lot easier. So when you put colors on top of it, you can lift them off and wipe them away almost endlessly and almost every color, even super staining colors, will come off of it. You can also put it on wood. I put it on wood a lot. Um, I think you can also put it on metal. I'm not sure, maybe plastic. It seems to stick to most things and it makes it so you can use watercolor on a lot of different surfaces. So if you don't have a tub of this stuff around in your studio, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I know I say that all the time, but it is such a good product and it makes it so easy to repair your mistakes. If none of the other tricks work, like Mr. Clean Magic Erasers or just lifting it or trying to paint over it with an opaque color or something like that, if none of those work, the watercolor ground will save you and it also comes in transparent. So there's like no excuse. You could just get this stuff and you can fix your paper with it and you can move on with your life and you don't have to start all over. Don't believe it when people tell you you can't fix your mistakes because they just don't know what they're talking about. They don't know that this stuff is out there, okay? So don't get discouraged and don't think that watercolor is too hard or that it's like this unforgiving medium because it's totally not any of that. It's awesome, you can fix it, and if all else fails, you can always make it something else, okay? Maybe your painting didn't have trees in it before, but guess what, bitch? Now it has some happy little trees in it. You're welcome. So the container says that you're supposed to let the watercolor ground dry for 24 hours. I never do that, almost never. Unless I put it on really, really, really thick, then I'll let it dry until it's dry because you don't want to mess it up. But otherwise, when it's dry to the touch, you can pretty much just paint over the top of it. And I've used it to fix all kinds of things. Sometimes I've even like torn my paper when I was removing tape and I'll like use some paper, acid-free paper glue to glue the paper back together and then cover over the crack with this watercolor ground stuff and paint over it and it's totally fine. And look at that, I just painted over it and you can't even tell that I even did it. It looks just like all the other squares and it's perfect. You would never know I did it. See? Okay, I'm gonna stop ranting now, but seriously, it's so easy to fix watercolor mistakes. Don't give up on yourself or your painting, ever. Imagine how many Watercolor paintings were never even finished, never have seen the light of day because somebody made a mistake and then someone was like, oh, you can't fix it. I don't know what to tell you. And then they just like threw that painting in the trash because they were like, hey, my friend who has a ton of watercolor experience told me there's no way to fix what I did. So that's it. And I don't have the like motivation or whatever to go and make a whole nother copy of this painting. Like I was almost done and then I ran my hand across it and now it's got red all over the place and it's done. You know what? You don't need to throw that painting in the trash. You just need to get you some of that watercolor ground and make it like brand new paper. And then your friend that told you you couldn't fix your mistakes, you need to fire that person. Cause that person does not know anything, okay? And you, you don't need that kind of like toxicity and negativity in your life. You don't need somebody in your life that's like, hey, you know what? You made a mistake, just quit. No, bitch, it's happy little tree time. If I can't fix that mistake, that lady gets a tree in the middle of her face. I don't even know. What am I even talking about anymore? You know, 
honestly, sometimes I get on these tangents and I don't know, like, where does it stop? Where do we all just get off the train? Where? I don't know. But you should probably get new friends. That's all. That's the moral of this story. You should get new friends that know things like I know. So then maybe you should just be my friend. And then maybe you should just pledge to my Patreon so that I can make more videos like this that are even better because I'll have more money to make more stuff. You see how it goes? See what I mean? If you give me more money, I'll teach you more things. That's all I'm saying. I am going to stop now. I am going to stop now. We are almost done. Dear Lord, this is the longest video. Oh my God. Okay. My mouth is dry and in the video I have actually left my desk like three separate times to sleep or eat food. So that is how long this is taking. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't even know what I just said. You know what? Oh my God, I'm so tired of this video. Okay. Take a deep breath. We're gonna just woo -saw. You know that whole thing where you rub your ears and calm down? We're gonna calm down now because we're almost done. And it's beautiful. I mean, the top of it pretty much just looks like baby poop, but then like the rest of it is like, wow, look at all the beautiful like rainbow that exists out there. So now I have to make it small enough to fit in my pocket with a field kit or something because it's ridiculous right now. So I'm going to cut it so that there's like a quarter of an inch of extra space all the way around. And then I'm gonna run it through the laminator after I cut it. I'm gonna cut it into four pieces and then I'm gonna run it through the laminator. It smells so bad. <laughs> I'll have cancer before this thing gets done. My laminator is super old. It stinks, and then like halfway through this thing, it broke. Oh, okay. We also understood the idea that we had to do it with compassion. Okay. At this point, like everybody in the room ran over to hold the thing down and keep it from jumping across the table. And then I had to pull the stuff through because the thing wouldn't roll it anymore. But after that, I had a really cool laminated thing that I could fold up into fours. If you don't cut it before you laminate it, it probably won't fold up. And it looks really cool. It fits in my pocket and it is laminated so I can spill stuff on it, which I'm gonna do because I'm a human trash can. And it looks like something that you could buy in a store, but I actually made that crap in my studio myself. I have a little tiny watercolor palette like that one. You don't wanna have a giant piece of paper that you have to haul around. <laughs> so you make a little card that folds up and fits in your pocket. Yeah. Ta -da! Of course, it doesn't want to stay folded up, but it'll get there. Yeah. So that's that. It was almost a disaster, but we saved it. And you probably learned a thing today, I hope. Maybe not. Whatever. You should probably pledge to my Patreon, and maybe my videos will get better. Or maybe they'll just have a higher production quality, and it will still be the same terrible crap that it is right now. Yay! <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, uh, next time, I don't know what I'll do. Maybe I'll uh, make a pallet out of a trash can. I don't know, that would be fitting, right? So thanks for watching this entire thing, and if this for some reason wasn't enough for you, make sure you subscribe to my Patreon and also my YouTube channel. And then you can watch more of this kind of thing if that's what you like. I don't know. Maybe next time I'll just make a rant and there won't be any art and everyone will just be like, why is this happening? Why are you still talking? It's been like half an hour. Aren't you tired yet? No, I never, ever, ever get sick of talking. You have to, like, cut my... my